questions for her. But um, for the time being, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our second group of presenters this morning. So um, as kind of a Iowa case study and a demonstration of the potential of this work, um, we are so pleased to have three uh, colleagues with us this morning. Um, Sally Dix, Executive Director of Bravo Greater Des Moines, Amber Lynch, the Executive Director of Invest Des Moines, and Tiva Dawson, the leader and co-founder of Group Creative Services. And um, we know these folks well. They um, do such incredible work here in Des Moines. And as was shared, I think, in the, the summit uh, materials that you all have, um, starting late, late last year, they founded a, came together to found a pretty um, exciting example of what it looks like to put artists at the center of local government. So our first presenter this morning will be Sally Dix, and uh, we'll go ahead and have a moment here to transition to those slides. Sally. Good morning, everyone, uh, and thanks for the introduction. It was great to hear from Michelle and some other really exciting examples happening um, out there. There's no shortage of good work to be done and good work already happening. Um, as David said, I'm executive director of Bravo Greater Des Moines, which serves as a region's arts council for central Iowa um, in the Des Moines metro. I'm really pleased to be part of this session this morning talking about centering creatives in community planning. Uh, we know there are lots of ways to invest in neighborhoods, to drive economic and business development, but one of the best ways to drive that while also building that social cohesion is through really thoughtful integration of public art. Um, as Michelle said, often public art is perceived as a sculpture or a mural or something that's designed over here and put over there, but it isn't really part of anything bigger than itself. Um, it's, it's decorative, but it's not always integrated. And it's often even appreciated, but it's not always really understood. It's not comprehensive and thoughtful. And we came together to tackle some of that in Des Moines to see if we could provide another way of um, connecting local government priorities and community planning to more thoughtful artistic integration. So what we did, as David said, is an artist in residence program. Uh, Tiva, you can advance the slide, though it doesn't really have anything to <laughs> contribute to the, to the comments, just keeping the conversation moving. Um, again, echoing a lot of what Michelle said, instead of focusing on the final outcome, you know, like the design of the piece or the particular installation. We ran this pilot project to focus on um, strength and creativity and innovation of an individual artist to create connections and listen for opportunities and then design unique solutions that really met community needs that were specific to a, a particular place. My colleagues will tell you a little bit more specifically about the program that we ran, but I did want to give a little background about what happened to set the stage for this pilot project in our community. Um, although the specific artist in residence program that we're showcasing today was implemented on a relatively short time frame, which I'm sure Tiva and Amber will, uh, will cover in their remarks, we went kind of fast. But we were actually cultivating this for a long time in our community. And I actually think some of that ground softening was part of what made this possible and made it successful. Um, this was a standalone experience, but it did build upon Greater Des Moines existing and hopefully growing appreciation for the role of arts and culture and art in public spaces. Um, Bravo's formation is a great example of how our community em embraces and understands the deep connection and the critical connection between uh, the public sector and the arts and culture work that's happening. Bravo is 99% funded with hotel motel taxes contributed by 17 local government partners. They think we're important enough that they give us a dedicated revenue stream that then we use to advance regional priorities. We use art as our vehicle but we really spend a lot more time talking about how the art is moving economic development, how the art is contributing to diversity, equity, and inclusion goals, how the art is bringing people talent attraction and retention. I'm sure these are all the same things you're talking about in your communities. And we've had some great success in making that bigger connection in addition, of course, to focusing on the art. So those regional priorities, we actually defined and articulated for Greater Des Moines. Um, we did a regional cultural assessment and we made it very clear that if you wanna do this thing over here, economic development or talent attraction, here's how the arts can help you. Here's how we can make that a piece of the puzzle. 
that ground softening that we did really helped make the case when we were trying to step forward and do this. There was already some understanding, some integration and some appreciation. I'll be honest with you. Um, when I was first approached about the artist in residence program, I was like, that's a super cool idea, but there's no way, there's no way we're going to be able to do it. Tiva was in that meeting. It was, Tiva was in several of those meetings. <laughs> um, but truly, as our community continued to evolve and our, our region continued to see positive results from partnerships like this, uh, we were really excited about the, um, the timing being right to give this a try and have this be a pilot project. And I was really lucky to have two amazing um, community partners willing to work with us to make it happen. So I'll hand it off to Tiva, who can tell you a little bit more about what we did. Thank you. Good morning. Again, I'm Tiva Dawson. I am the founder and owner of Group Creative Services. We are a public art consultancy based out of central Iowa. We help really kind of connect uh, much like Springboard for the Arts, uh, connect government and nonprofit groups, um, businesses with artists um, to advance their work and advance their goals. Um, and we've been fortunate to, to have lots of different partnerships over the years, including um, Sally with Bravo. I now call it the Sally effect where she will say, we can't do that. And then, you know, nine months later, Sally's got it all figured out and um, we're doing those new things. And I actually come from a background in government. I worked for almost 20 years in local government. So for the business, I kind of know the government speak and had this advantage of understanding what were the buttons and levers to push. Um, just like Michelle mentioned, finding creative ways like a marketing budget that you can integrate artists. That's why I feel like um, I'm really skilled at. And then we kind of partner up with a lot of artists to advance their goals. Um, this artist in residence is kind of different sometimes in what you hear when you talk about an artist in residence. Sometimes that also means an artist is given a, a place to stay or a studio for free and to allow them kind of like a sabbatical to do their work with a kind of no expectation of a product at the end. This one really is embedding an artist um, into either a government or a nonprofit um, group with the idea that they'll help advance the goals of that organization. The way that they're going to do that is not, you know, defined from the beginning. It really trusts the artist to embed themselves, listen, um, and to what the needs are and just rely on their creative juices to be able to help support them um, in some innovative ways. Um, again, not always knowing what the end result is. Sometimes it's hard for some organizations. They want to know, like, will we get a sculpture or a mural at the very end and what we're what we're believing in here is again the the power of the arts to help advance goals and doesn't always have to be known from the beginning and this one um we were trying to kind of figure out how to structure it um some artists and residents are like saint paul has uh, embedded an artist full-time for a year uh, with the budget we had, we just sort of guessed, well, we think maybe they'll spend 10 hours a week for six months and back, you know, tried to figure out what that would look like for a budget. We ended up just paying the artist a stipend based on that estimate and looking for them to kind of manage their time around that. So they had a stipend for their time as well as a stipend for um, a project at the end. Uh, so there was a budget for that as well. So they kind of knew the kind of money that they were able to play with for whatever they wanted to end up doing. We made sure that we're very clear about the goals for um, the the organization, um, but still, so we knew what, that they there's a focus on from InvestDSM um, that Amber can, can talk about on advancing kind of the commercial districts within um, some of their neighborhoods. So we're we're trying to be clear on the goals and the timeline for that project, and again, leave um, it wide open for what the product might be. Um, group Creatives was brought on board really to kind of help form um, and facilitate um, this whole artisan residency. So what we do as a um, consultancy, we help with sculptures, we help with um, public art master planning, but I really love these sort of programmatic angles, which is helping to kind of create um, space, new spaces for artists and helping to create a, a success for everybody and all the sides of the partnerships. And part of that is just really like every every art project finding the right artist uh, for the team. Some artists are really good at saying, I wanna make that thing and they go in their studios and they make that thing and come out. 
Uh, artists in residencies are really a different type of artist who knows how to work with lots of different um, sectors effectively, can listen well, and is facilitating the needs of others. Um, so that was a key first step. Uh, we had um, had the in stakeholders invest, uh, uh, interview several artists, and then they selected the final artist um, to bring on board. Um, so we helped to find those artists initially. And so I would say, if anything, that was kind of a key part of the process. And I'll shoot it over to Amber to talk about um, what it was like as a host agency. Great. Thanks, Tiva, and good morning, everybody. Um, really happy to be here and, and be part of this conversation. Um, I'm the executive director for InvestDSM. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that works on revitalizing specific neighborhoods in Des Moines. Um, and I also have a background in local government. Um, so I was a neighborhood planner for the city of Des Moines for about 10 years. Um, in fact, Tiva and I had overlapping time uh, for the city of Des Moines, and so that's how we first met. Um, but about three years ago, three, four years ago, the city decided that it needed to reframe its approach to revitalizing neighborhoods. Um, and one of the things that we did was create a new nonprofit that could kind of take those neighborhood plans that the city was developing and really um, be in charge of implementing them and and making the, those ideas happen. So that's what um, I moved over to build Invest DSM to do. And uh, I was a little bit predisposed to take something like an artist in residency on. Um, I had been at a national planning conference a number of years ago where I had heard the city of Boston talk about um, having an artist in residence that they used for community engagement work. Um, and some of the really amazing things that that spun out of that process. So when when Tiva um, approached me about uh, Bravo wanting to pilot this um, as a kind of government adjacent nonprofit, um, I was I was pretty eager to try it out. Um, I think in terms of being a host agency for something like this, we. Um, we really looked at Eleanor, our artist, as um, like an adjunct staff person. So we we felt like she was part of not just our project team, but but really out in the community on behalf of Invest DSM. Um, and so you know that took some money on our end. Um, we funded the implementation budget, um, and then Bravo funded um, kind of the artist stipend piece. Um, but we also had to plan to spend time uh, with our artist uh, and kind of support her all the way through the project. So, um, you know, Tiba mentioned we started with about a six month. Figured out somewhere along the way that we were going to need a little bit more time. Um, part of that was timing throughout the year. Um, you know, we were looking at starting to implement. Spring. And um, with the weather being what it was at the time, we, we needed to wait a little bit longer. So um, I think that was one of the things that we had going for us was um, a willingness to be flexible um, and to experiment a little bit with some of these ideas. Um, uh, it was really helpful to have group creative services who had, um, you know, they did the call for artists and kind of narrowed the field down to a top three. Um, and then our staff came in and interviewed those, those kind of last three artists. Um, and so Eleanor Kahn was the one that, that we felt just resonated with our project goals for this. Um, she's based out of Chicago. We were still in the thick of the pandemic, so it was an easy time to do a lot of things virtually. Um, and so having that distance between us wasn't necessarily a huge barrier. Um, but she also had a background in kind of scenic design for theater. Um, and we knew that we wanted her to focus on placemaking within one of the business districts uh, where we were working. We have four different neighborhoods. Um, and so we first took her around to kind of tour those neighborhoods. Um, and Tiva, you can advance the, the slide. Um, so we first took her around to to tour those neighborhoods. Um, we kind of left it open-ended to her. We said, you know, we want to do placemaking in one of these areas, but um, let's give you some background on each place, have you meet with some of the business owners, and, and we'll kind of go from there. 
Um, so she she really decided to take on the Drake neighborhood, um, which surrounds Drake University and uh, is one of the four where we are working. And one of the neighborhood's goals was to really put um, their business district, Dogtown, on, on the map as a regional destination. Um, and I think that Eleanor was smart in choosing this particular district. It's probably the most, out of the four neighborhoods we have, it's probably the most solid business district, the one that's that's already there, that's that's doesn't have a lot of vacancy. Um, and they had this dogtown identity that that dates back to the 30s and 40s, um, but really needed to be revived. So Eleanor um, went through a process of you know engaging with the business owners as as a group um, but also as individuals um, she had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations um, and really trying to discover things like you know what did the business owners and the neighborhood stakeholders feel was the function of this business district what did they want it to be known for um, and I think she was really able to kind of expand our capacity in that community engagement um, to also reach out to people who might not have been inclined to participate with, um, you know, a, a planner or a nonprofit staff kind of reaching out to them. Um, this gave us a reason to interact and um, something for them to feel like they were contributing towards. And so I think that was helpful. Um, after doing that engagement for a number of months, uh, Eleanor kind of came back and presented a set of ideas for how we could, um, uh, the themes that she heard emerging from that engagement work, um, you know, there's, there are some entertainment venues in this area. And so she was really feeling like what she heard was that this was about kind of culture and entertainment and, um, you know, attracting people to stay and linger and interact with each other. Um, but there was also this kind of lingering perception uh, from the 70s and 80s that, and 90s that, that this neighborhood and this business district is not a safe place to be, um, especially after dark. And so we wanted to try and combat some of those ideas or some of that safety perception. Um, so Eleanor kind of rolled out those themes. She had a number of ideas about how the district could um, start to build an identity as this kind of welcoming and, and diverse place that um, was a safe place to be that's about arts and culture and food and um, getting people together. Um, but most of the ideas that she had at the time, they were, you know, creating a parklet um, where people could kind of have a seating area out in the street or adding lighting into the district. And with the timeline and the budget that we had for the artist in residency, just the logistics of some of those ideas weren't going to be possible. So we kind of went back and forth and, um, you know, she went back around and, and had some more individual conversations. Um, and came up with a, a really simple idea um, that we could use as a starting point to activate this identity. Um, so what we landed on as her final kind of deliverable, uh, and again, you know, we went into this process very open-ended saying, you know, this is more about engaging people in this idea of, of what this place can become. It's not as much about uh, the end product that you're producing for us. Um, but the, still, there was an end product. And so it ended up being um, this uh, sidewalk mural um, and then a series of block parties that were hosted throughout the neighborhood. So Eleanor came up with uh, the idea of this kind of, uh, you know, squiggly line that, that, that wove throughout and, and connected various pieces of the neighborhood together. Um, and then she wanted a prompt to... to in, invite people to interact with the art as well. So she painted the question in a number of different languages, just what's for dinner? Um, trying to tie into the variety of restaurants and different types of ethnic food that we find in this area, but also sort of that universal thing is we all need to eat. Um, and so uh, she and a number of volunteers from the neighborhood uh, painted the mural on the sidewalk. It was intended to be temporary 
Um, so that was kind of how we got through some of the city hurdles um, is by say, this was going to be a temporary art installation. Um, and then we invited people during a block party to add to the mural, kind of answer the question with sidewalk chalk. Um, so that's what, that's what that became. And then that was replicated throughout the neighborhood over about a two week time period at seven different block parties. Um, so we had uh, volunteers throughout the neighborhood that organized a block party and painted the sidewalk uh, on their block. Um, and then again, kind of invited people out. Uh, they brought in food from the business district um, or potluck kind of style and um, really just got people, uh, I think, engaging with this idea that Dogtown is a business district for them as a neighborhood. It's not just for the students who go to the university, um, but it's, it's something that is part of their identity as the Drake neighborhood. Um, Tiva, if you want to go to the next slide, we can start getting into a little bit of the lessons learned. Um, so I'll kick this off and then and then ask that Sally and Tiva weigh in as well. Um, but I think some of the things that we learned through this process is we had the right partners at the table. Um, I think we had, we had a great project team. We we're all very willing to experiment with this and just kind of see what came out of it. Um, so having that flexibility and that willingness to kind of trust in the process uh, was really important. Um, we had both group creative services and, and Sally at Bravo who could connect us and Eleanor with, with other artists um, and other resources as we started to implement this project. Um, we were kind of in the right place at the right time. So it was, again, kind of a smart choice to be in the, the Dogtown Business District. Um, they were they were ready for something like this, um, and it really it gave people a reason to come together. Um, on the other side of things, you know, I think it helped us advance some of our organizational goals in terms of uh, trying to create a place and an identity, um, and we're carrying that forward into future work um, in Dogtown as well as in our other neighborhoods. Um, and we can talk more about that if we have time or after questions. Um, uh, a couple other things, though, is I think that we may be, you know, not knowing going into this what was going to come out of it. We probably could have used a year instead of six to nine months. Um, it got a little bit chaotic at the end as we were trying to implement the, the sidewalk painting. Um, there were definitely, you know, city regulations are not necessarily equipped uh, for things like this. And so, um, you know, even though I, Tiva and I both had relationships at the city of Des Moines um, and people that were willing to work with us, it's still, you know, governments are built to be risk averse. And so, you know, working through all the legal and the, the engineering and the, you know, the different departments to, to try and implement this was a little bit of a challenge and, and definitely took some time. Um, we sort of ended up going the route of begging forgiveness a little bit with some of this <laughs> um, and, and just doing it. And, and thankfully, I think it was overall very well received. Um, and then I think, you know, we ended up with a lot of volunteers at the end and needed a little bit more clarity around how those volunteers were being managed, um, what schedule they needed to be on to help with the painting and, and some different things like that. But um, overall, you know, I think what we did is we created an experience that was very memorable. Um, and that was something that Eleanor was able to do through the art is, is bring people together um, and create really almost an attraction that was memorable, that, you know, people would take photos with, that, um, as Michelle mentioned, you know, sparked interest from the media um, and uh, is still, I mean, the paint is still there a year later. And uh, so it wasn't quite as temporary as we thought it was going to be. Um, but it's also, you know, among the, the business owners in the district, it's really kind of given them that idea that we can come together and have an identity for this place. Um, and now we can start to build that further um, throughout with different projects as we move forward. So I'll leave my comments there. And Tiva and Sally, please feel free to add in. I might just add in one more thing in terms of right partners. Because this is a pilot, we weren't trying, we were fortunate enough to have people who, Amber and Sally, who understand not everything's gonna be perfect. Like things are not gonna all work out. Um, 
And that was really important when we're piloting something to have people with a um, tolerance for risk and things not always for failure. And so I think when you're always doing things that are new, you know, try not having one of your key partners, which you know, the three um, be folks that you're having to convince to do this, folks who seem kind of ready and willing and up for the spirit of it all was really important. Also, in terms of uh, unexpected results, uh, one thing I don't think you mentioned, Amber, but then six months after this project, there was a phone call from a corporation wanting to fund something in this neighborhood because of this work was ready to bring in, it was, I don't know, $50,000 project because of some of the, the um, ideas that were set up by the artists. So it actually spurred additional funding. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I wanna jump back in to make sure that we have some time for questions for all three of you, as well as to go back to Michelle. Um, first of all, thank you so much for that great presentation, Sally, Tiva, and Amber. I think just a quick um, comment from, from me would be that I think what's such a good lesson for everyone everyone here is how you had such clear roles and responsibilities, as well as how you started with this very, as you were just saying, Tiva, open, flexible attitude um, towards what the outcome would be. But then you were very deliberate and had very clearly defined outcomes and deliverables along the way. So I think that, that to me really stands out from a process standpoint. Um, kind of as a bridge back and to bring Michelle um, back into the conversation as well. I think Michelle kind of scanning some of the comments, why people are here today, what sizes and types of organizations and communities they're representing. One of, one of the questions I think is, you know, and, and all of you have talked about this, the importance of starting small, the importance of pilots, getting some small wins and building on that. But I think often the challenge becomes in the middle, right? You get, get some buy-in, get your local partners excited, but how do you take those to a greater scale? Funding is one piece of that, and I promise everyone will we'll talk about funding for a few minutes, but more than funding, Michelle, to go back to your primary impact slide, which I thought was so great, it seems to me, and what we hear a lot is that really shaping that community narrative and identity. As you go bigger, that's often where more challenges and more opinions and, and more people are involved. So. Could you talk a little bit about how you go from kind of those early small projects and kind of take those to scale in a way that um, brings the community along with you? Yeah, that's a great question and one that probably keeps me up at night more than I'd like to say. Um, <clears throat> but I will say that um, our goal at Springboard is always to, um, eventually, you know, have these ideas or projects um, driven and owned by someone other than Springboard. And so we might have a little bit of a different um, philosophy about it, but um, ultimately we are constantly trying um, to build the, the capacity and kind of technical skills of people that will, um, you know, be able to see this see the project through in a more permanent way. Um, and sometimes things aren't permanent. It's, it, I mean, I think my favorite thing is when you see the ripple effects and you can't really tie it back um, specifically to one project and, and say that it, you know, this, this was the first phase and this is the final phase. But um, I think also just um, really emphasizing the relational part of the work. Um, continuing to show up to people's, um, to the things that people care about and are, and feel are important. Um, so even if a, you know, a pilot project wraps up to continue to talk and maybe go to each other's meetings and just kind of stay in that generative space together as much as you can. And one story I have about that is that um, we did some really tiny and kind of hilariously simple projects with a public art, or I mean, sorry, with a public health group, um, literally a $15 project of like bike decorating one, one year. And because we like had so much fun doing that, um, when an opportunity came, which was a very last minute $50,000 grant from the Super Bowl that was in Minnesota, we knew each other's values. Um, we knew kind of that it wouldn't have to be a long meeting to decide what we wanted to do because we had already come up with the dreams together. 
And so it literally took us two days to put together a pretty huge and ambitious proposal and get that funding for a big public art sculpture. And so I think just really trusting that the impact of those relationships to help you be able to act quickly and authentically to whatever is next and around the corner. Thank you, Michelle. I love this next question. Someone has asked uh, if you already have artists on staff at your organization, but maybe their role is more operational or they're not, uh, their um, roles and responsibilities each day are not necessarily artistic in nature. How can you engage them in a greater way? Um, and I think this is coming from a, a local government um, representative. Yes, I can tackle that one. Um, one is just not underestimating the creative juice they may already be bringing to that role, right? So, and maybe figuring out ways to help widen that. And, you know, our our work is, everyone needs to continue to innovate in how we approach our work, whether it's capturing people's attention um, or just finding efficiencies um, in the day to day. And so every business or organization or government continues to need to innovate and advocating for the need for innovation, especially within government to create space for people that be able to bring their creativity forward in whatever that theme may be. So I think just making sure that there is um, a tolerance for new ideas and trying new things is the way that you create space for artists to be able to bring what they have to offer. I might jump in quickly there too. Um, we all work for the organizations that we work for. And so it's very easy sometimes to just be looking at what's on your plate. Um, a possibility for that, you know, I'm envisioning, uh, we do have an artist on staff here at Bravo and uh, that's not her primary role, but she brings great perspective. So we actively look for partners that are looking for artistic vision and perspective that we can connect her with and that we can say, you know, again, that advances not only Bravo's role as a, as a partner and a collaborator in the community, but it also helps one of our partners move forward. Um, and that's a, a win-win. So long way of saying, look beyond the value that individual could add to your own organization to broader objectives and other partners that exist in the community. Thank you both. Those are great responses. And I, and I also love the question because we also have a lot of artists on our team and I think almost everyone has some artistic background. And so it makes me think, how are we using that muscle in, in our day-to-day -day work? Um, another great question that came in, um, uh, hold on one second. There's, there's a number of good questions coming in and I know our time is, is limited. Um, we have a great question from someone representing a very small community. And I think it's it's kind of for our Des Moines group because it really talks about um, lessons from your project that maybe could um, be generalized to apply to a smaller community where maybe there isn't you know, such an established local arts agency like Bravo, funders like Invest DSM and, and a group creatives. But how can you still approach that in a very small community? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely possible. The partners just might look a little bit different. You know, I think about um, a smaller community that might have a main street going on. You know, it could be um, much like Springboard does in Minnesota. It could be partnering with that main street group. It could be with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, you know, how do we, but I think it depends a little bit on the community's goals. Um, you know, if the goals are around tourism or economic development, then that can be a great way to just activate different parts of the community. Um, you know, using an artist and kind of tasking with them with how do we activate these different spaces so that, again, it's sort of an attraction that draws people to them. Um, you know, that might be one way of looking at it. Uh, Tiva, I see that you've got some ideas as well. Well, just a quick example, again, just bringing your own creative juice to it. There's always money um, within communities. It's just being clever in how to figure out how to wiggle in with a, with a willing partner. One community we're working with, the police department is working hard at community engagement and relationship building in communities. And they were starting to think about hiring an artist to help facilitate that community engagement. They wanted new ways to do that more than just a hot dog, you know, in the park kind of thing. So really, like Amber said, it's kind of finding what the community goals are and then really the willing people 
what this police chief just happened to want to find um, some new approaches and um, doing some work in parks with the, around the arts it seemed like a perfect fit. So there, there's always, um, like I said, there's always funding. It's just continuing to just keep talking to people um, and, and figure it out. And they don't, all, these projects are not always as expensive as you think they'll be either. I was just going to add to that. Um, often what we see, Bravo is a, is a funder. Um, often what we see is people put funding as an artificial barrier to the taking the next step. It's real. And um, I'm delighted that Tiva thinks there's always funding available. That's not always the message we hear, but um, we, I, I do want to be, um, transparent, I think the three of us would all agree, we underestimated the human capacity that this was going to take, the, the time and the leadership from Amber and the communication and the, it, it was a lot of human resources too. Um, so just make sure that you are, as you're as you're building this, it's a, a group of willing and, and a group of able too that can contribute the time and energy to the work that needs to be done. And I, I do agree with Tiva. There's lots of creative places to find funding. Again, often as arts organizations, we look at arts funding, um, but there are there are lots of ways that the work that you're doing will be advancing other community goals and other pots of money uh, may present themselves. Well, Sally, that feels like you just handed me the perfect segue to talk about funding more. But before we do, we have a couple more great questions. I want to tell everyone we are going to run a little bit long, at least until 1020. So we hope you can stay with us. Um, before we move on, I also want to thank Michelle in chat for posting that Springboard does have a coming toolkit around their artists on Main Street program. So for those of you representing small communities, again, looking to adopt or implement something like what Des Moines has presented this morning. That's another great resource from Springboard. Um, I want to bring our artists into the conversation. We have several artists with us this morning and kind of synthesizing their comments and one uh, one question, it, it basically is, how do I approach as an artist? How do I approach my local government or community-based organizations if I am motivated to work in this way? And maybe Michelle, have you addressed that first? Honestly, first step is just, you know, following what is good to make some, you know, one of our favorite people to have a friend to be one of the officials, but how things work, and to you know what the duty and I think to air it posted in the duty handbook and um prompted if you are starting to um, feel Michelle, yeah. Michelle yeah. you can hear I'm gonna cut in some audio difficulties and our team is troubleshooting but I think it's gonna be with your team. Um so can okay. give us a moment. Um, yeah. I, I don't want uh, folks to not be able to hear um, what you're presenting. Um, um, Michelle, while we work that out, um, um, let's yeah, let's go on to the the funding piece real quick, and we'll bring you back to that point um, if we can here at the end. Um, so, funding, I would. Um, I would like to just start off by saying, um, highlighting a few state resources, and then I'll turn to our panelists to highlight other resources they're aware of um, um, or that they may have. First of all, Iowa Arts Council grants can be a great source for this work. We have our regular annual grant deadline in May that has passed for this year. We also have quarterly grant deadlines. Probably one of the best for this type of work is our Creative Places Project Grant. These are very small amounts of money, up to $2,500, but we offer them with the intention that they help to jumpstart things like this. Um, events, art activity, hiring artists, things that can build social capital, attract tourism, create employment opportunities for artists. And so we've been, we've been pleased to see some really good ideas coming in. In our first two rounds of those grants, please follow up with, with our team uh, if you'd like to discuss that. Um, just other state agency grants real real briefly. I know Liesl Siebert is with us today, or was at least, um, 
Uh, and she, with Empower Rural Iowa, has some timely grants open right now for those of you in rural communities um, that you can use for this type of work as well. Um, if, I can, if I can speak for Liesl on that. So please um, connect with her and, and her colleagues at IEDA about resources that they have. And then finally, I would encourage you all, we'll include this link in our follow-up um, communications, but we have a Creative Places newsletter that complements our regular Iowa Arts Council newsletter. And in that, we highlight a lot of other state and federal grants um, that can support this type of work. So please sign up for that newsletter uh, if you have not already. So now I want to I want to bring our other panelists into it. Um, Sally, I think you already offered some great advice, which is funding should not be the first impediment to having these conversations. It is a, a real barrier sometimes, um, but it shouldn't stop you from at least starting the conversation. So I wonder if others want to pick up on that or, or talk about resources that, that, that they know about. Yeah, I'll just jump in really quickly. Um, I mean, Tiva mentioned that we had we had a, a corporate funding opportunity come up uh, last fall. So it was a couple months after we had finished this artisan residence activation with the Block Party, um, and it you know it was a corporation that had money that they needed to give to a nonprofit and that needed to be spent by the end of the year. Um, this was last September. And so we were able to take advantage of that funding opportunity because we had some of those ideas in our back pocket that Eleanor, our artist, had come up with during the artist in residency phase. So we had this lighting idea already ready to go for Dogtown. Um, and we were able to then, you know, access that corporate funding. If we hadn't had an idea ready, we wouldn't have been able to access that funding source. Um, and so we did a lighting project with that last year, and it um, it was another a little bit of a you know using using lighting and and using um, kind of a lighting experience to attract people back to the business district. So the funders' goals were around small business support and recovery from the pandemic, and we were able to use the artistic project um, as a way to draw foot traffic to the district. Um, and kind of align those goals. So um, I think, you know, having that idea, even if you're not able to implement it right away, um, sometimes as funding opportunities come up, it's it's great to have something ready to go. I'll echo that, that often we will invest in an artist to develop a concept. So we'll pay them for the concept that would be unique to that organization or that site. And then that's more easily used to attract funders. Once you have this inspirational idea that has some shape to it, that doesn't require a ton of funding to do. It just helps, I think, to jump to the next one versus kind of waving your hands around and saying, we really want to do this thing, um, kind of having specificity to it that, again, helps to inspire people with a specific vision. Funding falls in place a lot more easily. Well, I know we are, thank you very much for those, those thoughts. And I know we are coming up here on 1020. I want to come back to Michelle. Uh, Michelle, if we want to See if your mic is uh, working well here. Just apologize. It looks like we're we're still experiencing a difficulty there. Michelle, I'm glad we had you for a uh, bulk of the session. So um, we'll we'll connect with Michelle after today's session. And um, for I believe the question was really about resources for artists looking to approach. Look for some of those. Um, tips and resources in our follow-up communications. But um, for now, I want to go ahead and thank all of our presenters for making time to join us this morning. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your perspective with our attendees. And before we go, um, just a, a couple of items about our next session. So we do have a break now. Our next session will start at 10.45 a.m. Uh, that is around arts, arts advocacy and connecting the grass roots and the grass tops. Um, and so please join us for that. And then of course, tomorrow we'll have our in-person conference at Mainframe Studios in Des Moines. If you have not registered yet and you still want to, we are accepting registrations today. So visit iowaartsummit.com. With that, I encourage you to continue to network through Hopin and uh, take advantage of the upcoming sessions. Thank you again.